Amen. Luke chapter 9, verses 57 through 62. We're going to get ready to start a new series over the next uh, <clears throat> two months. It's going to take us up right into the beginning of November, it, which is a follow-up to what we did in the summer. Over the summer, we talked about all things new and how God desires to do a new work in us and through us, both corporately and personally. And we looked at all the different ways in which God has new for us and how we can live into that new. Well, this being a follow-up, uh, the church council, uh, actually, uh, this came about about a month ago, that uh, I had challenged the council to bring <clears throat> some scripture passages to our meeting, and that was going to be a part of our devotions, as to what the Lord had been dealing with them in their heart about, not, not themselves personally, but specifically to Grace Church where we're going, what God has in store for us. And it's interesting, the verses and, and the passages of Scripture that were brought by each member of council, some uh, more than one. And after we had talked about them, after we had prayed about them, we saw that there was a common theme and a common thread that ran through all of them. And that's how the Holy Spirit works, amen? That's how God moves amongst his people and amongst people in positions of leadership that are responsible for the oversight, the ministry, and the vision of a church. And so I was actually going to start preaching through a book this fall. Uh, we were going to go through the book of 1 Corinthians, but the Lord uh, told me to put that on hold. And so over the next uh, a month and a half, we are actually going to be looking at these passages of Scripture that the council has been praying over and looking at and that has been brought to the forefront. And we see it as a way of next steps. Next steps, or as one person called it, living into the new. Living into the new. Okay, so we've established the new that God has had for us. We're walking into it. We're into it. But how now do we act in the midst of transition, in the midst of acclimation, what does God have for us in the new? What are the next steps for Grace Church in this new season? So that's what we're going to be doing over the next couple of, of weeks, and I hope you'll join and, and, and tune in if you're not able to make it, or maybe if you miss it, download, <clears throat> because I think that these passages are really, really <clears throat> speaking to where we are as a church and where God is getting ready to take us. And this first one, uh, Luke chapter 9, verses 57 through 62, is what we're looking at this morning. So when you have it, I'd ask if you would please stand as we show our honor and respect for the reading of God's holy word. It says, And it came to pass that as they went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord... I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to, has not no, anywhere to lay his head. And he said unto another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. And Jesus said unto him, Let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the gospel. And another also said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go and bid farewell, which are at home at my house. And Jesus said unto him, No man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. This is the word of God. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you and praise you for your word this morning. We thank you, Lord, for what has been uh, put before us. We thank you, Lord, for the time of, of singing and the time of fellowship. And now, Lord, we prepare ourselves for your preached word that is about to come forward. May you open up our ears and open up our hearts. Father, and may your Holy Spirit move within us in such a way, Lord, that we would not be the same person we were when we came in, but that you would change us today for your honor and glory. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat this morning. This is one of those texts when you read it is especially in our time and in our culture today can be very tough to read and be very tough to swallow. Uh, there's a lot of very 
uh, interesting things within the text that sometimes we read it and we say, well, why is that so? Or what does he mean by that? We'll get into all of this. But what we have here is Jesus calling out three different people within five verses to follow him. And each of these three people, for their own specific reason, wind up not following Jesus. They wind up not following Jesus. And so each of them, as we see in the text, had their own excuse as to why not to follow him. Now, I want to be very, or very specific this morning and make sure we understand. This is not a text about salvation, okay? This is not a text about salvation. Some people have read this and think, well, these people wound up being lost and, and didn't get saved. No, this is not a text about salvation, but this is a text, rather, of discipleship. I believe each of these people had an earnest heart and believed that Jesus was Lord, hence their desire to want to follow him. But they never were able to put their faith into practice. Jesus had so much more for them, but there were worldly things that prevented them from taking that next step. Prevented them from taking that next step. You see, discipleship is following the Lord Jesus Christ in your daily walk as a believer. Following Him in every way, no matter where He goes, no matter what He does, no matter what He has asked us or commanded us to do, following Him. You know, and it sounds so easy, right? <laughs> we love to sing the song, I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided. That's all wonderful and good that you can decide to follow Jesus. The question is, will you? We can set it in our mind, but at what point does it meet our feet and we actually go? And I believe that even in our culture, in our world today, we have an idea as to what we think it means to follow Jesus. Can I tell you, in the text today, it shoots that idea out. <laughs> and following Jesus means a lot more than what we think it does. And our reasons and our excuses as to why we can't don't flow with the Lord. It's almost as if Jesus calls each and every one of them out even in the midst of their desire and their profession to want to follow him. And they can't reconcile that reality with actually going. Notice you see at the end of the text, it never tells us that any of them went. Which is a good indication that they didn't. They couldn't get past what Jesus brings to the forefront in their declaration. Now listen to me. Like I said, uh, like I said before we get into the text, this is not a text about salvation, right? You can be saved, right? You can have made a profession in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, believing the finished work on the cross of Calvary. You can be saved. But listen to me, you can be saved and never be a disciple. There's a difference between being saved and being a disciple. <laughs> Being saved, you got your fire insurance. You're a new, you're a believer. You are born again. <laughs> Praise God for it. Amen? <laughs> but now you got to put the work in, and it's the work that makes you the disciple. It's the following Jesus that makes you a disciple. The question is, will we be disciples for him? Will we follow our Lord wherever he goes? Will we forsake all things? Will we prioritize him and the gospel above all else? Will we be sold out for Christ? No matter what is going on in our lives, no matter what is going on in our world. Those are the things that we need to wrestle with because this morning we see that three men thought that they wanted to serve Christ but actually found themselves to be so wrapped up in the world that they couldn't. They wound up being paralyzed. And I believe that there are three things today that we see in those texts that are prominent in our churches and in our world today amongst believers that keep us from truly following Jesus. 
Look with me at the first one. Look with me at verse 57. It says, And it came to pass that as they went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. Wow, what a declaration. You know, as a pastor, I would love to hear that from people within my congregation. You don't have to call me Lord. That's good. You just say pastor. And for some of you, I've heard that, and that is excellent, right? The, you come, up, Pastor, you just tell me where you want me to serve. I'll do whatever it is for the church. I'll do whatever. Praise the Lord for a servant's heart. Praise the Lord for someone to be that dedicated to the cause of Christ. I don't care. I'll be a doorkeep in your house, as David said, Lord. Amen? Just put me to work. I want to serve the Lord. And that's what this gentleman said. Maybe he saw the early workings of Christ's ministry somewhere else. Maybe he saw the healings that had taken place. He had seen the gospel proclaimed. He had seen people come to know him as Lord and Savior. Maybe he saw all of that and he was so excited and he so wanted to be a part of it. I want to be a part of this awesome cause. And so he ran to Christ and said, Lord, hey, wherever you go, I'll follow. I I I'm here. Wherever you go, I'll follow. Maybe he's running on emotion, right? He's excited. Here comes Jesus. I'm going to join this cause. I'm going to go. And praise the Lord for that excitement. But oftentimes that excitement doesn't mean we think through the process of what it means to actually follow Jesus. And Jesus points that out. Look at Jesus' response to this young man who says, I'll follow you wherever you go. You'd think Jesus would be like, oh, hey, let's go. This is great. Look at what he says in verse 58. He says, and Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. What a response. You want to know why Jesus responded that way? Because he was the Son of God. And he could see right through this man's emotions. He could see right through this man's words. You know, we oftentimes get on an emotional high, right? We'll come down and we'll recommit our lives to Jesus. Lord, I'll do whatever you need me to do. I'll do whatever you want. Can I tell you this morning, it's all well and good to do that, but if you don't truly mean it, Jesus sees right through your words and sees your heart. He knows whether or not that profession that you make at the altar is going to carry through past 36 hours. And that's what Jesus puts him to the test on. Right away, he calls his bluff. He says, look, look, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. He's basically saying, look, the ministry is not glamorous. <laughs> he says, I don't have a home. I don't have a place to call home. I don't have a place to lay my head to rest. Jesus here calls his bluff and says, do you really want to follow me? Because that's what it entails. Forsaking off, forsaking your home, forsaking your comfort, forsaking your luxuries, forsaking your preferences, all of that goes out the window if you're going to follow me. It's just you and me on that road now. You know, and we oftentimes are like this young man because we find out that he moves right on to the next and we know the man didn't follow. <laughs> he wasn't willing to give up his comfort. He wasn't willing to have a hard time. He wasn't willing to walk by faith in following Jesus wherever he may go. And, you know, we sometimes make that declaration, Lord, wherever you want me to go, whatever you want me to do, I'll follow you, Lord. You know what following the Lord in, it, it means in detail? You want, you want another sneak preview other than the foxes have holes and the birds of the S have hair, but the Son of Man have nowhere to lay their head? Go over to 2 Corinthians real quick. We get this idea that if we follow the Lord, he's going to take care of us in every single little thing. And we're never going to have any hardships. We're never going to have any troubles, right? Everything's going to be honky-dory. It's going to be wonderful, right? And then, you know, what happens is we make that profession and we go forward. And then the first time that we get uncomfortable and the first time we have to make sacrifice, we wound up saying, oh, the, oh I'm out of here. It ruins our perception. Listen to me, church. Look at, look at this in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 21, or 23 through 28. This is the Apostle Paul. This was the ministry of the Apostle Paul. Probably the absolute greatest, if we were to say greatest Christians ever, 
he, he's number one, right? Most of our Old Testament. If any man is blessed, it would be this man, right? Blessed in the way that we think a person should be blessed. Listen to his ministry. Beginning at verse 23. Wait. Wait, 11, 23 through 28. Yep. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more in labors. He's talking about his ministry. More abundant in stripes above measure. In prisons more frequent. In deaths often. Of the Jews five times I received 40 stripes save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeyings often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils by my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and in thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Beside those things that are without that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Wow. Ministry sounds wonderful, doesn't it? Following Jesus sounds great, right? And we get upset when our services move to a different time. We get upset when someone takes our spot in church. We get upset when pastor doesn't say thank you to us for something that we think we deserve applause for. Church, to follow Jesus means that our comfort goes out the window. We oftentimes won't go where Jesus calls us to because it means we have to change our schedule. We have to change our direction. We have to sacrifice some time or some hours or some money. Listen to me. When you, don't, uh, when you won't follow Jesus, <laughs> it's not going to be comfortable. But listen to me. You'll miss out on some blessings that are down the road. I believe this man missed out on a ton of stuff. The man didn't count the cost as to what ministry entitles, and oftentimes we don't either. The first bump in the road and we're gone. I'm not serving anymore. I'm done. I'm too hurt. I'm too wounded. This person upset me. This person didn't talk well about me. Folks, it's a part of ministry. We're gonna be uncomfortable. We have to be willing to forsake and put the time in and go wherever he wants us to go. The first one is comfort. The second excuse that we often have is one that, when I say it, you're probably going to look at me and, and, and wonder, but I, I promise I'll explain it. The second excuse we often have is family. Family. Look with me at verse 59. He approaches the next man. And he said unto his mother, or to, to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. Now listen to me, that, that, that's a reasonable excuse, right? In our day and in our culture and in our age, we would say that is a reasonable thing. But we find out that Jesus says no to him in the next verse. And so either Jesus is mean or there's something more going on here. Because by our culture and our classifications, that's, an, that's a realistic thing right here. It should be okay. Jesus should have said yes. I'm so glad that God's ways are not my ways and God's thoughts are not my thoughts. The moment we start thinking that this book and that Jesus' reaction and that Jesus' words are wrong, we're finding ourselves in trouble. <laughs> Amen? Yeah, amen. <laughs> I don't know if I want to agree with you today, Pastor. Listen to me. Listen to me. But the really cool thing about this one is, notice Jesus seeks out this man. It's different from the other two. The other two, the men approach Jesus and say, I want to follow you. Jesus seeks this one out. Can I tell you this morning, whether you know it or not, if you're saved, Jesus is seeking you out for you to follow him. You may have gotten saved and you may have gotten uh, cement in your shoes at the altar when you gave your life to Christ. Can I tell you, Jesus Christ is calling you unto him and saying, follow me. 
follow me. In fact, he's calling you by name because you are valuable. You are special. You do have specific things in your life, time, talents, and treasures that are a part of who you are, personality that is integral to the functioning and the building of the kingdom of God. Ain't nobody getting left behind. We're all supposed to be following Jesus. It's not just picking and choosing. But look at what he says. He seeks him out. He says, follow me. And he gives him his reason. He says, but Lord, allow me or permit me first to go and bury my father. Now look, you can get into all kinds of discussions about what this text means because we like to rationalize the actual words of Jesus here. But I'm going to take the, take the text for what the text says here. His father was dead. <laughs> right? And it makes sense when you approach it that way because look at what Jesus' response is. Jesus' mean and rude and crude response to this person. He says what? Let the dead bury their dead. That's not very compassionate. That's not very empathetic. But go thou and preach the kingdom of God. In other words, Jesus is saying, <laughs> there's nothing more that can be done for your father. It's really quiet in here this morning. There's nothing more that can be done for your father. He's dead. And notice what he also says. He says, let the dead bury the dead. So he's calling the rest of the family dead as well. Not physically dead, spiritually dead. He said, they're dead too. But you... You go and preach the gospel. You know, I shared with you before, I never understood how pastors got into the business of funerals. I understand weddings. Jesus has been a, was at a wedding, graced his presence at a wedding. I never understood funerals. We find one time where Jesus went to a funeral in Scripture, and he actually brought the man back to life. <laughs> I don't have that ability, y'all. <laughs> I can provide you words of comfort. I don't understand how pastors got into the business of uh, of that. I understand it's a great opportunity for us to inspect our souls and to possibly, you know, uh, receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior to hear the hope that's found in him in the midst of death. I get that. But look, he says, let the dead bury their dead. He said, there's nothing more you can do for them. And listen to me, if you go back in the midst of me calling you the family, you're showing more importance on the family. No, I want you to see that there's something more important than your family. Go and preach the kingdom of God. My calling on your life outweighs the stuff that you got at home. Now, I know what some of y'all are thinking, so let me explain. Well, hold on, Pastor. Are you telling me that if God has called me somewhere, I should abandon my wife, I should abandon my kids, and I should just go? That's what God wants me to do? No, that's not what it says. Does it say that the man was married? Does it say that the man had children? No. And what else do we know from Scripture? That one of the highest callings that you have as a Christian is to properly steward your family. Listen to me. When Jesus calls us to ministry, he never calls us to abandon the divine roles that he has given us, specifically as a husband and as a father. He never calls you to abandon those roles. That would go against Scripture. <laughs> that would go against Scripture. Listen to me also. God will never call you away from raising your kids. He'll call you to do something where your kids should come and be a part of it, but he'll never call you away from raising your kids. He will also never call you away from your spouse. Ever. Ever. I've heard people say before, Pastor, I believe God told me that I was supposed to divorce my spouse. No, 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 no. God hates divorce. 
Don't put that on him. Divorce is available as an earthly option, but it still hurts and sorrows God. <laughs> God can work all things together for good for those that love the Lord, but don't put that on him. He didn't call you to do it. He didn't call you to do something that he calls an abomination. It's the breaking and brokenness of this world that leads us to it, and he can work through it and mend it, but it ain't on him. You know, sometimes in this world, we use family as our biggest idol and our biggest excuse as to why we can't follow Jesus. And listen to me, your pastor is just as guilty of it as you are. Some of y'all know the struggle I have with the United Methodist Church and how close is too close to be a part of certain things. How much is too much? And there's sometimes I take a step back and I say to myself, how am I a part of a denomination that right now has a homosexual bishop and has not done anything about it even though it's against the discipline and against the word? How am I still a part of it? How much is too much? How close is too close? You know what keeps me oftentimes from pulling the trigger and leaving or walking away? And I know my wife is in here and she'll agree with you because we have these conversations often. First thing I think of is how does it affect my wife and how does it affect my kids? You know what else right now has kept me in the midst of it? Jesus hasn't said to go anywhere yet. But listen to me, church. The moment that Jesus does say, follow me, and it includes coming out of the Methodist church, this is the season where I be in prayer for my wife and in prayer with my children, and my wife and my children come with me, and we do what's best together for the Lord. All right? You see, God may call you somewhere, but if your spouse isn't on board, he may just be planting a seed that hasn't come to fruition yet. You know, I have a buddy who recognized his calling shortly after he got married, right? He, he married uh, a, a woman, uh, and, and shortly after they got married, he had heard the Lord say, I want you to be a pastor. You're called into ministry. He approached his wife about it, and his wife said, I'm not there. I'm sorry. I don't want to be a pastor's wife. Well, should he leave his wife? The Lord's calling him to be a pastor. Look, just because the Lord calls you to something doesn't mean it's here and now if things don't line up with the rest of Scripture. All right? Look at this. Look at this. He says, um, he says, go and preach the gospel. You know what happened? My buddy, over the years, him and his wife prayed and prayed and prayed. He got a job out of college as, uh, in, a, in, a, in a bank and started working his way up. They got involved faithfully in a church and serving in a church. He took on leadership positions within a church. He eventually got asked to preach and was able to preach, lead Bible studies, lead Sunday worship. You know what happened? Over time, his wife saw the calling on his life. And you know what happened? She eventually went to him and said, I can no longer ignore the calling on your life. You're called to be a preacher. I'm ready. Let's go. See how the Lord does that together <laughs> and not separate? And listen to me, a lot of Christians, we've made the mistake of God's calling me and to heck with my wife and to heck with my children. That's not God's will, church. Listen, I, I, I know I'm going up on a rabbit trail with this, but it's important for us to talk about it. The Lord will never break up your family by calling you to do something. It may be ramifications of it, but listen to me. You're called to do it together. That's why three times before we got married, the moment we started dating, you can ask my wife, it wasn't the first date, but it was at a McDonald's, all right? I said, I'm called to be a pastor, so if you can never see yourself as a pastor's wife, we're not doing this. And she said she was okay with it. Right the day before I proposed to her, I checked with her again. And she answered correctly, so she got a ring. <laughs> the night before our wedding. If you can't see yourself doing this, we can't go forward. Three times she had an opportunity to get out of this craziness, and she didn't take it. It's all her now. 
But you put those things forward at the beginning, church. But pastor, my spouse is an unbeliever. Did you marry him as an unbeliever? You got yourself into that mess. Don't be unequally yoked. Well, I can change my spouse. Have fun with that. You don't change anyone. Jesus does. Pray for your spouse. Don't nag your spouse. Amen. I know I'm off on a tangent this morning, but folks, listen to me. We put family, and it's not just our spouses. We use our kids as excuses to reasons why we can't do stuff. The biggest one today I love is sports. Well, pastor, we can't be in church. We can't be in Sunday school. We can't be in junior church because my kid loves to play sports, and so they're a part of this, and the games are on Sundays and stuff like that. You know the only reason the culture shifted stuff to Sundays is because we as Christians acquiesced. They used to not do that. We gave it up. Listen to me, my kids play sports too. My kids understand if there's something on Sunday morning, they ain't going. There's something that takes priority other than parents and other than, other than sports and other than family. Listen to me, go thou and preach the family of God. There is a .0004% chance that your child will ever be a professional athlete, but there is a 100% chance that your style will stand before his maker at some point and have to give an account for their soul. Follow the Lord. Bring your family with you. Follow the Lord when he calls you. Don't let family hold you back. Even, even, look, these were unbelievers that he was talking about. Don't let them hold you back. Don't let them hold you back. That's why he told them not to go back. Why? Well, I'm going to bury my dead and I'm going to go preach the word. What are you going to do that for? We give our family a little too much influence on our lives, especially when it comes to the things of God. Come on now, I've seen people, they don't come to church when their family comes in town to visit. Bring them to church. Introduce them to your family. Spend time in the house of God with everybody. Your family has too much. We let our families be idols in following the Lord. There's something more important, it's the things of God. That's what he calls us to. Now it's real quiet. All right, last one. Look at verse 61. And another also said, Lord, I will follow thee. Someone take an initiative again. But let me first go bid them farewell, which are at home at my house. Again, we have a situation with family. Although we don't know if it's family. It just says that they're at his home and they're at his house. And back then, living conditions were a little different. <laughs> you could have a community living at your house. <laughs> he could just be the owner of the house, right? Right? Never says family, all right? So another one who came to him, so we've talked about comfort as a reason why we don't take that next step. We talk about family as a reason we don't take the next step. The last one I want you to see this morning is preference. Is preference why we don't take that last step. Or we don't take that next step. Look at what he says. There's key words. Yes, he's excited. Yes, he wants to follow. Yes, he wants to go. But look, I will follow thee, two key words, but let me first. Those are key to that statement, but and first, but and first. In other words, Lord, there's more pressing things I have to do. Lord, I want to follow you, but there are some things I got to take care of first, and then I'll be on my way with you. That's all right, Lord, right? I can catch up with you later, right, Jesus? You see, Lord, before you call me into ministry, which again, let me just preface this because I know I'm using myself as a lot of uh, examples this morning. Uh, the pastorate is not the only ministry. If you are saved, you're in the ministry, period. All right? Lord, I know you've called me to do something, but first, let me, I, I need to have a spouse first. I want to get married before I go into the ministry. Listen to me. <laughs> My wife walked in the door for this one. Ministry is a lot easier when you're not married. <laughs> Listen to me. She is a blessing, but I also have another responsibility. Amen? Come on. 
And when I was involved with Campus Crusade ministry before I was married, and when I was involved at my home church in ministry before, it was a lot easier to pick up and go and do things without having to check with any other responsibilities and make sure she's taken care of first. So if the Lord's calling you into ministry now and you ain't married, run. <laughs> and you know what will happen? The Lord will bring you that person as you're in it. Come on. Listen, listen. Sometimes we use marriage, or, or, or hold on, or, let me finish school first, Lord. Let me finish school first. Let me get my education. Now look, I have an undergrad, and I went to seminary, and it's important to know and study things. Can I tell you, I use about 5% of my seminary degree in daily pastoral ministry. You ever see the, the education of the 12 disciples? There was none. Although they got the most valuable education, you know what it was? They spent time with Jesus Christ. You don't need degrees on your wall to minister to somebody. You don't need degrees on your wall to follow Jesus wherever so he goes. Well, hold on, let me, let me pay off my debts first, Lord. Lord. My wife did a year of teaching, and she paid off all of her debt. And we, well, she paid off all of my debt um, from seminary. That's why you get married in ministry. <laughs> listen to me. Listen to me. You know what happened? A week after we were debt-free, the dentist says, yeah, your son's mouth is really messed up. There's always going to be something. Just like I, I love young couples that, that say, well, we don't know when we're going to start trying to have children because we want to make sure that everything, you know, we want to be able to have a certain amount of time where we're together ourselves and we want to be able to have a home first or, or we want to be able to have this first. Or we want to be able... Folks, when it comes to having kids, there is no preparedness for having kids. Listen to me. None. You know what you do? You have a kid and you adjust. And then you have a kid and you adjust. And then you have a kid and you adjust. And if you're really crazy, you head into four and five. And then you're just trying to survive. <laughs> Amen, Ryan. Amen. There is, if you wait for the perfect time to have kids, you will never have kids. If you wait for the perfect time to follow Jesus, you'll never follow Jesus. You'll never follow Jesus. You follow him and you adjust. You follow him and you adjust. You follow him and you adjust. And you know what you find as you follow him? He is faithful. And he will supply all your needs in his son, Christ. All he, not all your wants, all your needs. That's what happens when you take that next step. Look at what he says. He says, And Jesus said unto him, No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. In other words, what he is saying, look, you can't constantly be looking behind you in the past. You can't be tied to something else and plow a field. What happens if you plow a field without looking straight? Everything goes crooked and wonky, right? What happens if you have other responsibilities and obligations that you keep trying to tend to while moving forward, right? The field goes unattended. It's not fruitful. It doesn't bear the things that Christ wanted you to bear. Look, he says, no, forget the past. Follow me. You know, we see an Old Testament example of this actually the other way. When Elijah called Elisha and said, you're next. God said, you're supposed to take over for me. Elisha actually said, well, hold on. There's something first I have to do. Wait a second. We have a contradiction in Scripture here? No. <laughs> Number one, Elisha was calling him, or Elijah was calling him, not God. Number two, you know what Elisha did? He said he had to go home and take care of some things first, right? And then when he came back, you know what he, he took care of those things. You know what he did? He killed his oxen and he burned his tools so that way he could never do the things that he was doing before God called him to be a prophet. <laughs> In other words, you gotta cut the cords and go. 
<laughs> when God calls you to. There is an urgency. And can I tell you, church, listen to me, we oftentimes get hung up looking at the past and memorializing the past and thinking the past is so great and the past is so wonderful and we look back, listen to me, trust me. <laughs> I, hear the, I hear the murmurings, I hear the complaints, I hear all that stuff about how we went to one service. Listen to me, you don't think that I have my hand on the plow going where Jesus wants us to go, knowing that he wants us to be one body, knowing that he wants us to have one service, knowing that he wants us to be all together in one fellowship, but I don't keep looking back thinking, did I make a mistake? I hear murmurings, I hear complaints, do I make a mistake? You know what God says? Get your mind off the past, get your face off the past, get your face on me and go forward. I've called you to do something, follow me! <laughs> Listen to me, church. We cannot serve two masters. The Lord says that. Man cannot serve two masters. We either serve one or the other. Which one's it going to be? I think Grace Church is going to follow God. Amen? I think we're going to follow Jesus wherever he calls us to go, no matter how uncomfortable it may be, no matter how much we got to change our schedule or we have to pray with our family or we have to deal with their grumblings and groanings at home as we do it. No, shepherd your family and move them in the right direction. Or even if it's against our preferences and there's things we think we got to do first or things that we'd like to see or, or other things or, or we keep looking back to how it used to be. Listen to me, our God is a God of the future. Our God is a God of, the, uh, of what's to come. And no matter what, he always has better for us than what we already had when we follow him. Will you bow your heads with me this morning as the worship team gets ready to come back up? Look, God is calling each and every one of us to do exactly what this scripture says, to go and preach the kingdom of God, to spread the good news. And he's calling each and every one of you here this morning in some way to take that next step in following him. To take that next step in following him. So I'm just going to quote to you the title of the sermon today. What's your excuse? We all have them. I think all of them can pretty much in our culture today be wrapped up in the three we looked at this morning, but we all have them. What's your excuse? What's your excuse this morning? You know what Jesus is looking for here? He's looking for him to be the priority in your life. Above all else. Is he? You know what he's looking for here? He's looking for people that are willing to risk everything for his kingdom. He's looking for people who are willing to sacrifice for the good of the body and the furtherance of the gospel. And you know what? When you make him the priority and you follow him, he always takes care of all the other things. That's why it says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. And what's it say? And all these things will be added unto you. But first you've got to seek the kingdom. You've got to follow. You've got to take that next step. And he will provide. Pastor, I don't have the ability. I don't know what you're talking about when it comes to me being a, a minister and me following Jesus. I don't have the ability. Look, the best ability you can have for Jesus is availability. The best talent you can have is willingness. Is that you today? Do you have that willingness to follow? Are you willing to leave your excuses behind and know that the Lord will take care of all of it? He may not show you how it's going to take care, but do you trust him to go? As the worship team leads us in our final song, the altar is open. Maybe you're here today and you say, I have an excuse I want to lay down. I'm, I'm wanting to recommit to following Jesus. Listen to me, if that's you, come forward. Let's recommit our hearts and our lives to following Jesus, to taking that next step. No more excuses. Lord, I'll go wherever it is you want me to go. 
no matter what that entails. If that's you this morning, the altar is open. I'd love to pray with you. You know, those words are very simple to the, to the old hymn, and I'm going to interrupt Ryan here for a second, but he can keep doing it. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. Let's stand to our feet. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back.